Well, I've been told I'm a better preacher than the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> it doesn't take me till midnight to put folks to sleep. <laughs> Come on now, that's funny. <laughs> but if you fall, don't expect me to help. So, amen. <laughs> anyway, well, let's open our Bibles. We've been uh, started out this week in uh, Psalm on Wednesday night, Psalm 21. And uh, I'm not going to read the uh, psalm again, the whole psalm, but I do want to just pick up the uh, last two verses. And uh, because I want to continue where I left last night with some more thoughts. And, and uh, anyway, let me just go ahead and read psalm, verse, uh, psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. The scripture says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I don't know about you, but waiting is not something that comes natural for me. Amen? If you're a good wait, waiting type person, doesn't bother you to stand in line for hours on end, praise God for you. Amen? Uh, when I go to Walmart, that's like... Uh, you know, you have physical therapy and torture, and somewhere in between there is going to Walmart for me, okay? <laughs> so, uh, it's not my favorite thing in the world to do, and where our church sits on Highway 90 on the Gulf Coast, uh, you turn left, and about 100 yards away is a super Walmart. It's way too convenient, and so anyway, I end up being there more often than I, than I wish I was. But I'm going through looking for the shortest line and then thank God for the self-checkout. Not that I, anyway, I, I'll catch myself running off in a lot of directions if I'm not careful. But uh, I don't like to wait. And unfortunately, uh, I think the Lord obviously knows that about me. And so there are a lot of things in life that God allows that forces me to wait. Now, the theme, believing to see. As I study this psalm, it tells me there's going to be some waiting involved. Well, that was supposed to be encouraging. And uh, that's all I got with that. So <laughs> let's jump on to the other parts. Amen. <laughs> um, I started last night and or excuse me, the, the uh, night before that and just kind of outlining the psalm. And uh, we spent Wednesday night with the abundance of faith. And uh, just looking at that, opening that thought up. And uh, the fact is, God has been so good to us. All the miracles that we've seen in our own lives. Uh, no, the Lord hasn't parted the Red Seas or opened the Jordan for us in a physical sense. But I believe many in this room tonight can share miracles that God has done. And if you don't have some miracles that God has done in your life, you really need to step back for a moment because... Your children need to know that we serve a miracle-working God. Amen. We've seen God do some miracles in our church, and I'm sure Pastor Brooks can, can make the same claims, but uh, sometimes when you're locked in and serving God in your church, in your location, in your area, it's hard to recognize, realize, or see that God's working all over this planet. God's doing amazing things all over the place and showing Himself. When I first went to Grace, Brother French's daughter-in-law had stage 4 or stage 5 cancer. This is all the way back in 1989. They didn't have all the experimental drugs they have today. They didn't have all the different options and things like that going on. And we just started praying. I mean, there was fasting and praying and praying and praying and praying. Susie French is still alive. 2020, just had, I don't know, second or third grandchild, fourth, fifth, I don't know how many they have now. And uh, Brother French is a great grandfather, great, great grandfather. He's going to hit 92 in April. 92. Every Saturday we have soul winning, he's out knocking on doors at 92. He gets help climbing up on the bus. We drive the bus out to the neighborhood. Brother French is knocking on doors. Brother French singing in the choir at 91 years old now. What's your excuse? Amen. So, um, abundance of faith. We need to know there's a miracle working God. Uh, were you guys there when Zebby got burned? You left? 
Okay. Uh, evangelist in our church, Brother McDerris, they uh, had bought a, a small piece of land. The Lord gave him a small piece of land. He had a, a desire in his heart to start a family camp and youth camps and preacher boys camps and things like that. Anyway, so they would go up and work on the camp and, and uh, we, we were gathering supplies. We'd make a run up to where the property was and, and building different things. And so uh, they went up there one weekend and uh, they were going to camp out Friday night and uh, clear land and start working and, and, and preparing things. And so uh, Saturday, uh, I guess it was a set, no, it was Friday afternoon. They started picking up and they were going to come home and uh, because there was a rainstorm moving in, so they were going to cut things short. And so... Uh, Brother Zeb, nine kids, you know, from, I guess, uh, Philip was probably 16 at the time, the oldest, younger one still in diaper, diapers. And so uh, little Zebby was probably eight or nine, maybe 10 years old at the time. So this is eight years ago, I guess. Eight. So Mama set a box by the, the door. They, we had a little cabin built, and uh, Mama set a box by the door that was not trash. Well, Zebby didn't know. And uh, he walked over and picked the box up and walked over to the fire where they were burning all the trash and threw the box on the fire. And the fire's getting bigger and being a little kid, he's sitting there watching the fire. And one of those uh, propane tanks for cook stove was in that box. That thing blew up on Zebby and melted his clothes to his body, burned his face, hair burned off, eyebrows are gone. Brother Zeb grabbed him. Started getting the clothes off of his body because they were melted to his skin and it was continuing the burning process. Raced him down to the hospital. They, they life flighted him up to Birmingham to the, uh, the, the burn clinic in the children's hospital. And they were in there that night and the next day and the doctors are looking at Zebby and they're saying, listen, dig in for the long haul. You're going to be here six months to a year. Brother Zeb was in there. And uh, they're, we're, they're, we're praying as a church and, and people around the world are praying and uh, we're trying to figure out and, and Brother Zeb's sitting there looking at his son and he's begging God and he said, God, this may be a selfish prayer, but I don't want my son to grow up looking like a monster. We need your healing. We need the great physician to show up. And that night as he's praying that the doctor walks in, the, the cartilage is completely burned off his nose. All you can see is white bone cartilage sticking out. The doctor said, we're going to have to cut his scalp like this and stretch it because the skin's starting to dry up as it heals and it's pulled his eyelids up so high he can't blink. So we're going to have to do this surgical procedure and drop his scalp down so he'll have eyelids to blink. And we're praying and we're praying. And uh, the, the Patch Club group at our church, Zebby's group, uh, they all colored pictures and they signed their names to it. And we brought a whole bunch of them up there. And uh, they were sitting there and, and laid out on the wall in little Zebby's room. And, and, uh, and people are praying and Brother Zeb prayed all night. The next morning came in and the doctor said, what happened? He said, what do you mean? When they pulled the covering off his face, his nose skin had grown back overnight. They did not have to cut his scalp. <laughs> One night. Zebby looks up at the wall while they're talking. The doctor's there. And he says to his dad, he said, Dad, I'm going home in 11 days. The doctor kind of looks at him and his dad looks at him. And he, you know, come on, parents. Our children usually have greater faith than we do. And so dad's trying to cross, not cross that line of doubting a young uh, child's faith. And get child to see reality of the situation, even though God's doing. And so he's like, Zebby, why do you think that it's going to be 11 days? And Zebby looked up at the walls and he said, there's 11 pictures from my patch club. And uh, so we're, I'm going home in 11 days. 11 days later, we loaded him into the wheelchair and roll him out of the burn unit of the hospital. He didn't have to stay six months. He didn't have to stay four months. He stayed 11 days. And if you, if Spurgey, uh, Zebby walked into the room tonight as an 18, 19 year old kid, you'd never know he was burned. Listen, God can still work miracles today. It's not just a song. Thank God for the song. And I love it. And thank you church for all the music this week, but those songs are only portraying a truth and those truths are still real today and we must know that in our heart of hearts so we can live it. And listen, you've got to share it with your kids. 
It wasn't long that Joshua passed on, and the Bible says in Joshua 6, a generation rose up that knew not God. We are one generation away from atheists in our own family. Abundance of faith. Aspiration towards God in Psalm 27. We, we haven't touched on that subject yet. We'll get there. Assurance of protection. Appeal for help. Tonight I want to look at the acceptance of waiting. And uh, I want to go back over, if you would, into Exodus chapter 14. Spent a little bit of time here in uh, the message last night. Uh, just using it as uh, part of the, uh, the focus on believing to see. In Exodus chapter 14, let me read a couple of verses here. Uh, the main one, of course, I believe folks here tonight know the story. Exodus 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Father, thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you that we do serve a miracle-working God. Father, sometimes the miracles take place in a very short and timely manner. But Father, sometimes they take time. Lord, whether you choose that we wait or whether you choose to work in a much faster way, I pray, God, that you would help us believe. Father, help us to have the assurance of our faith, to know that you're in control, you're watching over us, you're able to take care of us, meet our needs, strengthen us, protect us. Bless our time together tonight, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I jump into the thoughts, I do want to say thank you, church, for taking care of us so well, the Russ family putting up with us, I mean putting us up, amen, that's a blessing, <laughs> and uh, all the meals, we've been able to fellowship with some of the families in the church, we greatly appreciate that. And uh, I'm humbled by the invitation of Pastor Brooks to invite us to come up here. And uh, uh, for 14, 12 years, I guess it was, as a missionary, I traveled all over. And uh, so I, I'm not a pastor that just uh, travels out and preaches out a lot. And uh, I think for two reasons. Number one, who's going to invite me? And then number two, I've already traveled a lot. And so uh, I, I don't have this itch to go and see the world. Uh, but I do like to go once in a while, and I've had some of our former supporting pastors invite me, and uh, I've preached missions conferences and Bible conferences and things like that. But it's always, it, it's, heaven is going to be sweet, and one of the reasons is there's no goodbyes there. Uh, you, you, as a church family, understand the situation with having military families in your church. Uh, you build an almost instant friendship. You know you have to. We were not military, but we were missionary. And our children would go into a church and they'd have best friends. And it wasn't social media best friends. They'd have great friends started just that fast. We all knew we didn't have a lot of time. And uh, the amazing thing was that there were, there were always special friends along the way that you knit, God would knit your heart with them. And uh, you could be separated for two, four, six, eight, ten years. And then you step back into their presence and it's just like, boom, just picked right up where you left off. And uh, thank God for it. And uh, that's the friendship that I feel with Brother Brooks. I hope you feel the same way. Amen, brother. <laughs> if you don't, don't tell me. And I can just keep going happy as I am right now. Amen. Just happy to be here. <laughs> so anyway, I, I appreciate the invitation. And, and uh, never been up in this section of the country. And uh, my goodness, we went to Mount Rushmore today. Hallelujah. Tess has been able to see more snow in a week than she's seen in all her life. <laughs> Amen. And uh, once we hit South Mississippi, she won't be seeing much more. So, amen. You guys can enjoy all of that for us. I don't own a snow shovel. And uh, I, I was thinking about Wednesday night, what am I going to do to scrape my, my uh, car windshield off? And so I am out there using my hand on it. Like, I remember why people up here have those little scrapers and brushes. Amen. I, I don't own one of those. <laughs> amen. So I'm not asking you to move south. Be right where God wants you to be. If you move south, thank God, uh, there's lots of creatures, critters, and more heat and humidity than you'll ever dream of. Amen? Brother Gary couldn't stay there because he never grew his gills. <laughs> Whew, if you've been down there, you know what I'm talking about. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Believe to see. What a blessing. 
Uh, Exodus chapter 14. Last night, uh, we looked at a position to assume in Exodus 14. I just referenced that briefly. We've been talking about faith. Um, and uh, we spent our time looking at the second thought of a perception to acquire. And uh, with that thought, we looked over in the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the things that they found in the fire. Their perception, I believe, changed after they went through that situation. And uh, thank God that we can do the same, and uh, we can learn from it. And so thank the Lord for it. And so a position to assume, stand still, a perception to acquire and see. But then uh, I want to look at this evening... Uh, a promise to await. Look at verses 15 and 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. A promise to await. Now here's the thing. And if you talk to somebody who's walked with the Lord for a long time, you'll hear something to this effect. Sometimes in life, it seems like God takes a long time to put things together. Then all of a sudden, one day, it's like, boom, and it's all happening. It's exciting. Um, a promise to await. We're in Exodus 14. 400 years of the Israelites living in Goshen has gone by. They're not in the promised land. They're just coming out of Goshen. Abraham had been given the promise from God directly all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. And this would be a nation, a great nation, more than the stars of the sky, more than, in number than the sand of the seashore. And God would give them a property, a place. And so Abraham, by faith, took his family and left the earth of the Chaldees and headed for a place that he never even saw, but he was given a promise. There are promises that have been given to you and I. This statement of the psalmist, believe to see, believe to see. Listen, though that statement is based upon the promises in this book about the goodness of our God in the land of the living. Hallelujah. We serve a great God. And so a promise to await. Sometimes the promises of God don't happen instantly. Boy, I wish they would. Sometimes I feel like I'd be a better prayer warrior if I could ask God for something and boom, it was done. Amen. Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm not thinking, you know, along the lines of the genie in the bottle and all that kind of stuff. That's not where my heart is. But I think, you know, sometimes the, the things in my life that have been big deal and it just seemed like it took a long time. I got saved in, in 1979. You know, the preacher's kid who was a dirty, rotten scoundrel needed salvation just like any other person in the world. Amen. Couldn't get to heaven on my daddy's salvation. I couldn't ride his coattails. Now listen, God has no grandchildren. You're not getting to heaven because your mom and daddy are good Christians. You're not getting to heaven because you go to church all the time. You're getting to heaven if you have a personal relationship with the Lord. And that's established through faith and trust in the work of Christ alone. His blood shed on the cross to pay your sin debt. And we all have it. There's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a wonderful promise. So in, in, in July of 79, I got saved, went off later uh, to youth camp. During the uh, youth camp uh, uh, preaching, that Friday night, I got called to preach. That was 1979. I didn't get into full-time ministry until 1997. And there were some times early on, because in 1979, I wasn't even in high school yet. By the time I hit high school, I looked around at ministry... I had to find everything else in the world I could do to get out of that mess. My dad, all the years I was growing up, never once owned a car that we did not have to work on. So I kind of correlated the pastorate with mechanic work. We build houses. So you're going to be probably working construction. Because, you know, you're going to do what you know how to do, right? So we knew some framing, roofing, siding, a little bit of finish. Dad didn't get those nice inside warm jobs. 
<laughs> we're framing in the state of Maine, state of New York. Yeah, where it's nice and chip the ice off the foundation before you can start putting on the... Anyway, so uh, all these things I'm looking at, and I'm looking at the grief involved in being a pastor. Yeah, you know, innocent little kids. Hey, Dad, uh, so-and-so said they're going to be at church today. Where are they? Now, listen, little kids hear stuff. Be careful. And you think they're just over there playing in the corner. Oh, they're listening to your phone conversations. If you don't believe me, just wait till they get a little, little upset. And all of a sudden, they're going to start repeating the things that you've been saying when you get a little upset. Hey, man. Good stuff. And so I was hearing these things. My, you know, I would go out on soul and with my dad and knock on the door. Oh, yeah, preacher, we'll see you Sunday. Wow. Maybe dad will be able to, I mean, all these promises. Maybe dad will be able to quit working construction. And he'll be able to be a full-time pastor. Oh, they didn't show up. And why do all these Christians lie? Who wants to work with folks like that? I worked in prison ministry. I found this out. You better not lie to an inmate. Your credibility is shot. Now they can lie to you all day long, but they're not there to minister to you. You're there to minister to them. Amen. And so uh, you better be credible. Are you credible with the Lord? Make family promises to the Lord. Keep them. Amen. This isn't family time, and so let me get back over here to a promise to await. So I'm called to preach. I'm going through all these things, get into high school. I wanted nothing to do with the ministry. I tried to get away from it. I got a scholarship offered full ride at Wyoming Tech. <laughs> what ended up out in this part of the country, amen? I was top of my class, scored real high on the ASVAB. I had the recruiters after me. And so I went to tell my dad, uh, listen, I've got some career path choices here. Uh, the recruiter said I could be all that they wanted me to be. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now I scored a 96 on the ASVAB, so I was ready to go. And they were all kinds of promises. All the branches were calling me up, and I was all excited. I'm thinking, hey, if I'm going into military, it's going to be officer. I got to know there's an easier way than just toting things around all the time. So, you know, I'm having all these big visions and dreams and all that. And uh, then uh, uh, the Chrysler Corporation came into our class. I was in the uh, uh, Votech school and, uh, you know, ran these tests and did these things. And as school year comes along, my senior year, spring uh, comes heading towards graduation. And Mr. Walker pulled me in the office. He said, listen, uh, you've got all the grades, GPA across the board. You've got all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted. You sign on the dotted line, full ride scholarship at Wyoming Tech. Their graduates have a 98% placement ratio. It's a great school. Everything will be good for you. Wait till I tell dad. I'm going to work and earn money and help the pastor. I can be more effective. I won't lie to him. I'll go to church all the time. I'll give him money. Amen. And I'll be able to drive a car I don't have to fix. It took a while and a lot of things God had to work out in my heart and in my life and finally, in July of 1997, I stepped out in full-time ministry. What am I saying? I'm saying God gave a promise to me when he called me. What is the promise that I will equip you, that I have a job for you, that there's something that I'm molding and making you for? I'm a part of it. I like being a part, amen? I never did like riding on the bench during the game. What's your position? Left out. <laughs> Amen. I'm a professional splinter collector. <laughs> oh, no, I want to be out in the game. Hallelujah. And when the Lord calls, guess what? We're in. Hallelujah. I finally made it. But it was years and years and years of God having to mold and, and, and work on me. And sometimes it was the hammer breaking up the rocks. Sometimes it was the plow plowing up the fallow ground of my heart. All of these events and details. And then finally the realization of the promise. Along the way, God wants, or excuse me, along the way, Satan wants us to think that God doesn't really mean what he says. It's the same tactic all throughout scripture. Yea, hath God said. Did he really call you to teach that Sunday school class? 
Did he really call you to run that bus route? I mean, look at the unappreciativeness of the kids that ride the bus. Did he really call you to go to that, call? I mean, that Liberty Baptist? <laughs> Amen. Come on now. I know our church, we have very similar stand and family and some music and all these things. And, and uh, I'll be out knocking on doors and say, people say, yeah, I've, we've heard about y'all. Well, there's different ways that people express that. We've heard about y'all. That's what you want to hear. We've heard about y'all. Same words. Slightly different meaning because of the different expression and body language. Amen. We've heard of y'all. <laughs> okay, great. Who they've been talking to? Uh, listen, a promise that awaits us. What is that? In our day and age, I don't know where our government is going. I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know what is going to happen to our religious freedoms. God's call on our lives is not going to change because the government stands change. You say, well, I've been trying to do this and do that. And listen, sometimes the promises of God don't happen right away. We have to believe to see. When I was a little boy, we would go up to my grandparents' house, my dad's parents. And um, from the time I was about 11 years old, I don't know why I thought this way. I don't know what I saw in this situation. Well, actually, I do. I didn't realize that at 11. But I thought my grandparents love each other. I mean, they really love each other. Now, I knew my parents did, but they're, you know, ministry and finances and raising kids and all the squabbles and the discipline. And so I'm not really looking at mom and dad as being in love. I'm looking at them as the, uh, the tyrants ruling over us. Amen. <laughs> And knowing that they loved us, but you know. <laughs> and so I looked past my parents to my grandparents and I thought, they love each other. 50th anniversary, they went for a walk holding hands. Married 60 years and they flirted with each other. <laughs> and I thought, that's what I want. Amen. He that desireth a wife desireth a good thing. Amen. Amen. This is Bible where I'm not out on a limb somewhere here. <laughs> and so I wanted to be married. Well, not at 11, obviously, but I graduated high school. <laughs> Got to make my wife tells me all the time, honey, you didn't finish the story. You didn't give all the details. So I, while I'm preaching, I got to make sure I give all the details and finish the stories. Amen. And so I got into, finished high school and uh, uh, realized, okay, yes, God wants me into the ministry. My dad and I had a big blow up fight. Dad won. So off to Bible college, I went. Amen. Dads, don't follow your sons. Your children. Lead. And it's not always easy and it's not always fun. My dad had let me have my way. There's no telling where I'd be today. You're going to Bible college for at least one year. I was so mad. And off to Bible college, I went with a chip on my shoulder. And God got a hold of my heart and things turned around and thank God for it. It's right where I needed to be. And so I couldn't find a wife in college. Terrible. My friends were getting engaged. More friends were getting engaged. It's my third year. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. <laughs> and so I didn't want to just have a bad time. So we formed our own little, uh, what are those things they have in college when you get a fraternity? Is that what it is? A fraternity? We, we started a fraternity. Bachelors to the rapture. <laughs> hey, bye. <laughs> a wonderful outlook on life, right? <laughs> so there we are. We're, we're, we're just ready. Well, listen, the, I shared the first, I shared the second half of the story on Wednesday night. And then I made the comment, I don't make decisions quick. And some of y'all started laughing. Well, now this is kind of the backside of the story, okay? It took a lot of years for God to break me and get me to stop fixing my life and putting things where I wanted them to be, or so I thought, and just humbly 
trusting him by faith and living in obedience to him. I always had a plan A, B, C, and D for the steps of the future and the path of the future and where I thought I should go and what I thought I needed. And that included in the area of family. And so I wanted a, uh, there, this, this young woman showed up to Bible college and I must be the will of God. Her daddy took over the church that my dad started in upstate New York. I had met her when we were five or six years old. And so that must be it. And so we tried to, tried to make, start a relationship. And, and I found out she was still in love with my best friend from back when my dad lived in, in New York State. I'm like, well, way to go, Danny. You can, I guess, you know. Anyway. <laughs> oh, there's so many sides to the story. And I won't go into it. But God spared me from myself. And it's the grace of God, not my ability. It's the grace of God, not my intellect. It's the grace of God, not because I always made wise and great choices and decisions in my life. It's just the grace of God. I don't like to wait. And then sometimes the Lord says, you've got to wait to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So finally, in January of 19... 89, I'm sitting in first day, second semester of class, Sunday school administration, and uh, Brother Kuntz walks in, and, and instead of giving out a syllabus and going over the class, he preached a message from Matthew 6.33. And I'm sitting there like somebody took a two-by-four and went, whack! Oh, I had always focused on the first half of the, the verse and thought God was failing me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I forgot about that little and his righteousness. I skipped that part and went straight to, and all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, I'm saved. I'm in Bible college. I'm seeking the kingdom. Seek ye first. Amen. So why isn't God adding a wife? So Brother Coons preached on that section. And I sat there and realized when God made Adam in the Garden of Eden, he didn't make four women and ask Adam, which one do you want? More than that, he didn't even ask Adam any advice. He didn't say, Adam, what color hair do you like? What color eyes do you like? Would you prefer, you know, 5'8", five, 5'2"? Five, you know, what, what, what height would you prefer, Adam? He didn't ask Adam any advice. He put Adam to sleep. Young people, go to sleep. Let God do the operation. Amen. Amen. You notice Adam was operated on to get Eve. A lot of stuff in there. That's for your family conference and all that good stuff. So what I realized is I'm not supposed to be finding my wife. I'm supposed to be finding God. I knew the Lord had someone for me, and I knew it was a godly desire. But it took years of God not giving up on me for me to realize a promise. There's so many illustrations to go through in my own life. My wife and I wanting children. Seven years. Lord. Her baby sister got married a year after us. And they started having kids one right after the other. Nine of them. We're still waiting. Not many folks can say this. But we, our first daughter arrived. Well actually. Uh, we flew in on the airport. Got off the airplane on the tarmac. It's in the Philippines. And uh, this. A uh, red-headed lady that ran an orphanage over there is holding this little Filipina baby girl. And the little girl's got a sign that says, Hi, Mommy and Daddy, it's me, Becky. That's how we met our first child. <laughs> the delivery room was a runway. <laughs> now listen, it was a promise of God. I believed in our heart. We believed in our hearts that He was going to bless our home with children. We wanted it on our timetable, but God does things on his timetable. We talk about believe to see. Listen, in my heart, since I came to grace, I believed that God was going to bless and multiply the church and the church was going to run 500. He hasn't done it yet. 
You know what I realize? He may not even do it with me. But my job is not to push the church to 500. My job is to be right with God and serve Him and seek Him and walk with Him in truth every single day and trust God for the increase. Man, it's easy to, to look at the posters and the t-shirts and, and claim the slogan, believe to see, believe to see, believe to see. But he talks about waiting in those two verses. And waiting is where we tend to get discouraged. Where we tend to get frustrated. God is not slow. Many times he's simultaneously working on different things at the same time. A friend of mine, Brother Souter, preached a message in our church about two trains running down the same track and then they finally converge at the station. We don't see the other train running down the track. We only see our track. But God's over here orchestrating, doing all kinds of things. And in his time, it's all going to come together. We see that throughout scripture. How many days did Goliath challenge the, the uh, army of the Israelites? 40 days, day after day after day, till finally David shows up. And they, the, the challenge was met and Goliath was taken care of. How long was Israel in Egypt? 400 years. 400 years, generation after generation. And the Israelites got easy uh, going and everything was all right until finally another Pharaoh rose up that didn't know Joseph and life changed dramatically and quickly. And the people got uneasy and cried out to God. Maybe that's what's going to have to happen to America. God's going to have to stir the pot. Shake things up a little bit. Before we cry out to him. The way that we should. From the time that David was anointed king. 1 Samuel chapter 16. He sat through 40 some odd years of Saul's reign. Tried to serve him, tried to help him. Saul tried to kill him. David knew he was going to be the king. What's the thought this evening? The thought is this. I don't know what things that God has called you to do, promised that he would work out in your life. Things that you have claimed in, in your family or in your heart, in your personal walk with the Lord. I don't know individually what those things may be. But I know this. If this is of God, it will happen. It may not happen instantly. It may take time. Listen, learn to value the waiting on the Lord. Why? Because the lessons are so many times learned while we're waiting. Man, if I got everything I asked for all the time, as soon as I asked for it, I'd be just as spoiled as if I treated my kids that way. Tessa will ask me about everything in the store when we walk in. Dad, can I have that? Can I have that? Dad, can I have that? What about this, Dad? Can I have this? Well, Daddy, that's pretty nice. Can I have that? Dad, can I have that? Finally, I'll reach a point. I'll say, don't ask for anything else. She's gauging the tone of my voice and the look on my face. I know. Smart Kids are smart now. So I don't repeat it. I just hold the glare. She waits just a moment. Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. What has the Lord instructed you to wait on? Don't rush his will. Don't push it. But do not sit on the sidelines while you're waiting for it to come to pass. Well, preacher comes along. Hey, brother, so-and-so, sister, so-and-so, could you help here? Uh, no, pastor, thank you, but I'm waiting on the Lord. <laughs> now listen, there's too many church folks around the country that are just waiting on the Lord. Yes, we wait on the Lord, but not as a bystander, but as a spectator. I mean, not as a spectator, but as a participator. Amen. Got to make sure I get the words right. <laughs> we have to be involved in the work. Why? Because the work is great and large.
Amen. That's what Nehemiah said when the, the, the Jewish people were trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and restore the gates and put everything back in place. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 19. The work is great and large and we're separated upon the wall one far from another. What place thereof ye hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. What am I saying? I'm saying Rapid City needs a church that is experiencing revival. Why? Because Christ must be lifted up through our lives so that He, when He's lifted up, will draw all men to Himself. You know, listen, you can beat every door in this city and try to push people to make a decision. But it's when the sweet Spirit of God is moving because we are revived. It is just an amazing thing. People will come up to you and start talking to you and they don't even know why. Hmm. That's awesome. I don't know about you. I don't have the gift of gab. I meet everybody I meet is a stranger. <laughs> Amen. My wife never meets a stranger. We went to Mount Rushmore today. We're going to park and my wife goes, that guy looks like a preacher. It's a group of guys walking, you know, getting their, out of their car, jackets on, they're walking. And so uh, we, we start walking up, and they're, they're standing there taking pictures. And the guy turns around and said, y'all mind taking a picture for us? Where y'all from? Mississippi. <laughs> We're from Mississippi. My wife said, are you a preacher? <laughs> there you have it, two preachers from Mississippi at Mount Rushmore. We're trying a little bit further, and this lady asked Ethan, would you take a picture? And I listened to her accent, and I said, Pinoy Caba, are you Filipino? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I started talking to Gollum, gave him a gospel track, got the witness to him. Amen. Amen. Now listen, God can do some amazing things. Sometimes God has us in between. And it feels like we get set aside. God doesn't set any of us aside. Brother McDerris came to our church. He pastored. He was in evangelism. He'd actually come to South Mississippi to help plant a church. And the guy that was starting the church wasn't a good deal. Things weren't working well. One Sunday morning, the guy gets up and says... God ain't in this. We're shutting her down. Walked out the side door of the church Sunday morning. Didn't you have service? Miss Valerie, Brother Zeb's wife, was about to deliver a baby. They couldn't leave and go anywhere. So they started looking for a church. And they stopped in one night at Grace. And for seven years, the Lord allowed us to work together. And the testimony of Brother Zeb was he needed healing. Stopped into evangelism, thought he had a bunch of friends, and found out he really didn't have many friends at all. While he was waiting for God to redirect his life, he was busy all the time. Preach, preaching for me, we call it Sunday school. He, actually, we nicknamed it early church. <laughs> so we had two preaching services every Sunday morning, amen? Amen. He was leading the choir. Man, he was doing a great job with the music. Oh, my soul. And people would be lifting the rafters on the, you know, the shingles off the roof. They're just singing right out. And he's, he's singing louder than they are. Amen. And just wonderful. And so the whole time we were working together, I, I knew in my heart that God was going to move him on. And I'm watching this. And what I was so thankful for is that he didn't just sit down on the pew and wait for God to give him his next marching orders. This thing about waiting is multifaceted. And so my point is this. We are instructed by the psalmist to believe to see. Somewhere between faith and sight, there's an open space. 
There's a space of waiting. And during that waiting time, many times our faith is being tested. Our resolve is being tested. Sometimes we're in that middle section because it's a time of healing or restoration that we need. Sometimes it's a time of clarification because God was doing this and now he's going to do that. I don't know what may be going on, but I know this. We can trust God. It's easy to say that in church. What about when the anger kicks in? Because things aren't going right. I'm, I might be the only one here that gets frustrated. If I am, pray for me. <laughs> smile and breathe, smile and breathe. <laughs> I don't like waiting on the Lord. At our home church in Grace, when I went there at seven, I started praying and asking God for a youth pastor. And the way that I prayed was based upon an experience that took place in the Philippines. I went to preach a Sunday at Cebu Bible Baptist Church. And that Sunday after the morning service, the youth pastor, Brother Lamagbas, asked me, uh, would you preach to the uh, afternoon teen group? I said, sure. Now, it's a large church, so I'm expecting 100 teens or so. You know. Show up, there's almost 500 teenagers. I'd been a youth pastor for 12 years. I said, Brother June, how did you build the youth group to 500? He said, um, these kids are the grandkids of my first batch. How long have you been the youth pastor? 40 years. Right here. Same church, 40 years. I said, Lord, that's what our churches need. Every man called to preach is not called to pastor. And that doesn't mean a person is a second class citizen. It means that God needs every piece and every part for the body to fit together and be whole. So I began praying and I had a couple of guys come through. One was a missionary intern. He went off. Uh, started his deputation to go to the field and then another guy came along and just didn't have peace in my heart about it and he left and Brother Zeb filled in for a while and, and uh, we, the men of the church, we all filled in and, and uh, then a few years ago, I had a guy, Brother Zeb, we sent his family out to replant a church in Florida and another guy came in and he was going to help run the school and be the youth leader. About uh, 20 months later, he was gone. Hallelujah. And that was, anyway, I won't go there. And so, um, uh, I'm still praying. And now I'm praying for a youth man and a principal again for our Christian school. And so uh, I don't like being the principal. I like being a pastor. And so there I am as the principal again. And um, I met this guy. Who, his um, his sister-in-law's father-in-law. It's Mississippi. So you, you can be your own grandpa. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> His wife's sister, so his sister-in-law, it was her father-in-law. I got it. Yes. Whew. Anyway, there was, a, there was a guy in our church whose son married a girl, and that girl's sister was married to this other guy. All right, I got to stop trying here. So this family had just recently joined the church, and they said, oh, you need a principal. And so uh, they came in one day and they said, well, we just joined the church. Would you show us around? So I'm showing them all around the facilities. You know, there's this, this, this. And uh, we ended up at the apartment we have on property for the uh, principal to live in. And uh, so they said, well, would you mind if we introduce you to somebody? Uh, I always get an uneasy feeling. Just the way things are working out. So I'm praying very quickly in my mind before I answer the question. Okay. So the Lord brought this young couple to our church. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Great couple. And he's leading the Christian school, and I'm still praying for a youth leader. December, two Decembers ago, Brother Ben came in my office, and he said, um, Pastor, I'm not doing a good job as a principal. I don't have administration as my spiritual gift. Matter of fact, I have no administration, and I feel like I'm always chasing the ball and running behind and failing the parents, and the school's not growing, and I'm not doing a good job. We're getting frustrated and 
we believe God wants us here. As soon as he said that, I'm thinking in my mind, you were supposed to come here as the youth leader. Because when he's teaching the class, kids are zeroed in, they love him. The guy loves teaching grammar. <laughs> See, miracles happen. <laughs> and the kids enjoy his class. English grammar in high school. The kids enjoy his class. I don't have to say any more. Amen? And so he's sitting there, and it hits me. And so I looked at him, and I said, well, Brother Ben, uh, we need to pray. Because he said, I know God brought us here, and I know we're supposed to be here. We love it here. This church family is our church family. But that's where we are. And I said, I want you to pray about being a youth leader. And he said, funny you said that. Three months ago, my wife and I started talking and praying to that end. But we didn't want to bring it to you. We wanted it to be the Lord. So we prayed, finished out the school year. I brought it to the deacons. We talked about it. We kept everything in wraps because I didn't want the students to know that the principal wasn't going to be the principal next year. And so, boom, May, graduation, next Sunday, 100% unanimous vote. And now I have a youth leader. 12 years. It's worth the wait. Well, go back to Psalm 27. Let's wrap it up this evening. I don't want to take too long. Psalm 27. We've read the verses numerous times, and I'm sure you have throughout the year. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The very next command is wait. Wait. I want to encourage you that as you wait, don't sit down and wait while your hands and or your fingers are, you know, twiddling. <laughs> Not doing anything. But stay busy while you wait. Amen. Amen. David was going to be the king one day. He didn't stay at daddy's home sitting on the couch and watching TV. Until Samuel came and said, all right, Saul's dead. So come on, it's your turn. Unfortunately, there's folks like that in the world. Well, when the pastor asks me to do something, then I'll go ahead and help. No. We are instructed to wait on the Lord, but while we're waiting, we are to be busy. When we wait on the Lord, things don't always happen right away. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes the wait is a good time. Thank God for it. Sweet fellowship. Brother Zeb was with us. And we just fit together like two peas in a pod. Perfect. He was a visionary. He was, uh, if he preaches, he'll tell you straight up. He's got ADD, ADHD, and every other diagnosis there is about that situation. He said, uh, he told me right up front, he said, uh, now I've got a, he said, I want to start a ministry a day. So you're going to have to tell me no. Well, that's great because once there's a ministry started, I'll just run with it until the Lord returns. <laughs> so we just fit together perfectly. He'd say, can we start this? Uh, no. Can we start this? No way. Can we start this? Oh, yeah, let's do it. Amen. And so, uh, listen, we just fit together. So while he was waiting, God used him in a great way in our church family. Then all of a sudden, one day, the Lord said, all right, you're not going to be preaching early church anymore. Now you're going to be pastoring this church down here in Florida. And so when, the, when it came time for the McDerris family to leave, it was a sweet sorrow. Tears shed, church-wide fellowship. We miss them. We still support them every month. We still help the church buy air conditioner units and materials to fix their auditorium. He's trying to reach a retirement community. He sent me a text one day. He said, Pastor, we're going to have Lord's table tonight. We're having uh, Jello blocks and insure. <laughs> His poor kids went down there. There's no kids in the church. <laughs> Just rough. But listen, he waited on the Lord. But while he was waiting, he stayed busy. And church family, listen, maybe folks come in here on the military like they like, like do at our church. If guys come in for training school, I tell them, listen, get faithful in church. Yes. When we have church fellowships, We'll get a ride for you to get over here. Don't just sit by and not do anything spiritually while you're here. And don't use a lack of transportation or this isn't my church as your excuse. Wait on the Lord. There's waiting to be done. 
wait on the Lord. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it happens quick. Either way, God is good. Either way, God is right. We have to trust him. I found it easier to trust him when he answers quickly. <laughs> when it takes time, that's when I start asking more questions than I really need to be asking. So I found this. When I'm staying busy, I don't have time to ask questions. Let it sink in. Amen. So fill your time. When you're waiting on the promise of God. Stay busy for him. You say, well, pastor, I'm not in charge of a ministry. Then pray. Be a soul winner. Be a support system. Help out. There's always stuff to do. Wait on the Lord. Father, thank you for your goodness. Father, I don't always understand why it feels like it takes so much time for things to come to pass. But Lord, I know that there is an instruction in your word given to us on more than one occasion that we are to wait on the Lord. We know that the prophet Isaiah said, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And Lord, what a blessing it is to know that when we wait upon you, you can minister to us. Come alongside us, encourage our hearts and strengthen us for the journey, for the battle once again. Lord, sometimes the waiting is years. Other times, things take place very quickly. Father, whether it happens quickly or it takes time, help us to trust you. Help us to believe. And then, Lord, as our faith becomes sight, Lord, help us to rejoice. What a blessing. Bless our time of invitation, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.